Okay. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, here with us, we have uh, Alessandro Melis. Um, and I want to, to do a little introduction of, uh, of him, and then I let him uh, uh, go with, uh, with his lecture. Um, very important, uh, Alessandro Melis is not just Italian, but Sardinian. So he was born in Sardinia. And then uh, he, he studied in, um, in Tuscany, where he founded his, uh, his studio, Heliopolis 21. And then now he's uh, co-director of uh, uh, the Cluster for Sustainable Cities and founder of the Media Hub at the University of Portmouth in the UK. And um, we are very happy to have him with us today because we believe that he is really um, an innovator in, in our field. And he, is, uh, he has been able till now and for sure in the future to open new path uh, for the project and for architecture. He has been chosen this year uh, to be the curator of the uh, Italian Pavilion at Biennale at Venezia. And uh, let's see what's happened in, uh, in the next months. Uh, but it's very interesting, the theme he has he, he chosen that is resilient communities. That is such a, like a, a very contemporary and nowadays uh, theme. So uh, welcome Alessandro, I turn off my camera and uh, I let you start. Thank you very much Silvia. I'm uh, now going to share my presentation. Uh, we said uh, one hour, right? Presentation. Exactly. And, okay. Yes. I put a little bit, uh, sorry, if you don't mind, a little bit of clock, so I will avoid to go longer. Okay, so um, uh, a better cake rather than a, a better slice of uh, of the worst is uh, is um, how can I say? Uh, I'm trying to uh, suggest that uh, we are in a period of crisis and we need uh, uh, a game changer condition, and we would like to. I would like to discuss about this game changer condition. Uh, why the crisis? So, I mean, mo most of my presentation will be about uh, what is a crisis and how we have to deal with these uh, kind of conditions. So, in this case, when I'm talking about the crisis, I'm, I would like to talk about uh, the origin, the causes of the crisis, not uh, its consequences or its impact. So, uh, even though we are in a pandemic situation, I would like to discuss uh, about the uh, systemic condition of the environment that lead to this pandemic situation rather than to uh, discuss uh, these uh, uh, co the consequences of crisis so well, how you will see from my presentation i i strongly believe uh, according to uh, literature that uh, uh, the pandemic now is a symptom is not a cause of the condition so the cause is here it's uh, it, the so-called uh, hockey stick. For those who don't know what is a hockey stick, is uh, the diagram that has been published by Michael Mann and uh, um, other colleagues from different fields of sciences, uh, dendrology, for example. And this is the first, uh, um, how can I say, empiric uh, demonstration that uh, global warming is here. It's existing and it's a fact and it's. Uh, uh, due to um, anthropic actions. So uh, it is surprising if we talk about uh, communication, how very often we still hear about this uh, condition as an hypothesis. Well, it was an hypothesis uh, more than 20 years ago. It is a fact uh, since, uh, let's say, 1999, uh, 1994, when the first OK sticks 
diagram have been uh, released. Uh, it's interesting to notice that uh, these diagrams are also kind of uh, uh, relevant for us because they declare in a way how like, the ecologic system, how the environment is our uh, uh, ally in this condition because we could find uh, uh, these evidence right because the planet has given this evidence to us. We know for example, uh, about uh, uh, traces of the past climate, uh, thanks to what the trees have told us, the corals, uh, the um, drillings in the uh, polar ice have told us. So really we are in strong communication with the environment and we have all the information we want from them, from it. So the second question is, what does this crisis has to do with architecture? Many times we hear that, yes, yeah, so of course, this is a global problem. This has to do with policy, with decision making, but uh, not, not very often we are stressing the fact that uh, as planners, we have, uh, we have a major role in this. We know that the construction market is uh, uh, probably, is surely, we we'll say, not probably the first cause of CO2 emissions. So it's the first cause of this cause of this uh, crisis, sorry. But uh, even more, if you consider the, um, the, uh, uh, organization, the design, the deterministic design of the city of today and the system of transport which, the, which is uh, derived, which is a consequence of this deterministic design of the city, we also need to agree that uh, probably the impact of the design, not the construction, but the design is uh, probably around 60%. Um, so this is why I would say that uh, not only architects or planners, engineers have a role in this, but probably they have the major role. They have, uh, they are guilty. We are all guilty, and uh, uh, but also we have a possibility. You, we have the possibility to transform our job in a, let's say, something more strategic and uh, uh, try to help people to build a vision for the future. Well, uh, when we um, when we talk about this crisis, there is another reason why I would say that people coming from a creative background or technological background are very relevant today. And this is what they call the what we called in the cluster for sustainable cities the impossible equation. So if you consider the overall situation in terms of use of soil. Uh, according to Jonathan Foley, we are using 98% of cultivable soil today. And uh, uh, the rest of the planet is covered by uh, environment that are needed to have this production. So I'm talking about forests, mountains, mm, lakes, uh, and uh, uh, also deserts that uh, allow us to live in a sort of uh, balanced uh, ecosystem. Uh, we have to understand that we are at the border, at the limit of the survival of this planet. Uh, uh, if we consider that we are going to have a population of uh, 10 million people in uh, 30 years and uh, uh, due to climate change, we have a reduction minimum of 20% of the production uh, productive soil in the next 30 years, we are clearly facing a sort of uh, impossible equation. So more people, less land, uh, how we can produce more food, more resources. Well, it, it sounds impossible. So there are a lot of... Uh, uh, theories, but let's say, let's say most of us are not uh, caring at all about this, but uh, those who are caring of this, of course, are taking in consideration different perspective, more linear, less linear. And this is a, a little bit the core of my presentation, what I mean for linear or not linear thinking about this problem. So can we solve this impossible equation considering the equation in the terms that I'm showing you now? Well, my answer is no. But uh, uh, the other question is, can we solve, can we over, overcome the crisis? My answer is yes. And why I'm so convinced about this possibility? Because at the moment, of course, I know that the situation is this. So I know that we are, we are going to have bigger cities, but we, have, uh, we will have a sea level rise. We will need more food, but we will have desertification. So it's clear that uh, uh, I don't know how the city of the future will be. But I know for sure that uh, this city, whatever it looks like, uh, will have uh, three characteristics. The first one is, will be a compact city. The second one will be a resilient city. What it means? It means that we will uh, be forced to live in more extreme condition. The pandemic we're living today is one of the possibilities, but we have uh, 
uh, tens of options that we have to consider, or let's say we have to put in the uh, framework of the future scenario. So this leads to the third character of the city. So the city must be radical. So it is probably something very different from what we know today. So we are discussing before with Silvia, it's probably not the moment to build on top of what we already have in terms of solutions. Yes, we have to build on top of what we already have in terms of embodied energy, in, in terms of existing urban fabric, that's for sure, but not in terms of conceptual design. So sorry for the Italian, uh, but I will uh, translate this. So let's imagine that we are uh, therefore in a world that the limits of uh, uh, its resources and uh, uh, the population is its, its ma maximum expansion. So how can we deal with this world? Uh, let's say that this is not a new situation. Again, what uh, we need to consider as architect is the fact that uh, um, we don't uh, need to consider a short span of uh, time uh, or we don't, need, we don't have to do this anymore. Usually we consider uh, the history of architecture as something important for our knowledge and this is also what I'm doing. But we also have to consider that uh, um, history of architecture belongs to the history of human, uh, of, sorry, of civilization. So it's, uh, let's say, 10,000 year uh, span history, but human have been on this planet for a longer time. And let's say the history of humans can be calculated uh, in, uh, let's say, 200,000 uh, 200, years. And if we consider organism and even more, of course, we are talking about million. So probably we need a different perspective. We need a longer term perspective in order to uh, avoid the uh, wrong uh, understanding of wrong trends. And I will explain a little bit more what it means. However, coming back to history, so we have a, a period, let's say, the, the easiest to find is, uh, let's say, in the, in what we call the crisis of the 14th century. The crisis of the 14th century has very similar uh, condition than what we know today. It was uh, a climate crisis opposite direction because it was uh, a small ice age. Uh, there was the population that uh, achieved the, uh, the limits of uh, uh, of the um, period in terms of uh, uh, resources, uh, even though we are talking about the population of 80 uh, million people. Uh, but of course, we have to consider that uh, uh, the technology, the knowledge, the organization of the society, this was the maximum possible. And of course, there was a third uh, parameter, and uh, it's surprising for me because when I was talking about this uh, since last year, I would have said, well, we are not facing this, but we are going to face similar situation. I'm talking about the death, um, the Black Plague. Um, of course, it's a different condition today, and uh, luckily for us, even uh, less deadly than the uh, Black Death. Nevertheless, uh, um, and also consider that uh, in the Middle Ages uh, uh, has never been proved a relationship uh, uh, between uh, the crisis, uh, the famine and the uh, and, uh, plague, even though for sure we know that the lack of uh, uh, hygiene, uh, the problem of the organization of the cities and uh, um, uh, limited uh, uh, vitamin and protein um, available have been accelerated and uh, uh, increased the power of the Black Death. However, uh, we have to consider, I'm considering this for a different perspective. This is the, uh, the triumph, triumph of death. And uh, I find this, uh, uh, this fresco very interesting. It's, it's in Pisa, it's my hometown. Uh, because it gives a clear understanding of what was the perception of the society or what was familiar to them. And I think the way we see the society, we see the world around us, it's very important, even more uh, than the solution. So the only possibility to have uh, to be a uh, game changer is uh, to have uh, a perception of what is around us uh, that can allow us to get rid of the uh, existing condition and be more revolutionary, more visionary. So, uh, as I said, for me, there is another aspect that is more important than the similarities of the crisis. It's uh, what happens after this. 
So how these crises have been overcome and who did these, uh, uh, who contributed to this uh, overcoming of the crisis? We all know what happened after, especially for us, as it, uh, for Italians, it's very clear. It's very clear how uh, the, um, the uh, crisis of the 14th century have been overcome by a, a complete revolution of the society and by a um, new generation of uh, intellectual, if you can, you, where I'm talking about the humanism, uh, driven or led by what we can call an army of artists. Of course, it's a little bit extreme telling about an army of artists, artists but I will tell a little bit more what I mean for this. Generally speaking, what uh, I think it's important for us is to understand how not how the society has been uh, able to uh, provide solution following a linear path, but how the society has been able to overcome the crisis through a revolution. So the question is, what happened if uh, we are admitting that uh, uh, the production of food was at its maximum and was feeding uh, 8 million people. How this was possible that uh, 150 years later, the uh, population of Europe was much uh, more than 80 million. I mean, so the limit was not real. So this is clearly for me the answer to our, uh, our uh, impossible equation. There is something in, uh, how can I say, in the uh, human capabilities to design scenarios that goes beyond the linear thinking. And uh, of course, when we talk about the revolution uh, uh, in, agricultural, uh, in agriculture, in the Renaissance, we are talking about the fact that before we were able to use just a few seeds uh, from, um, from the plants, and then we have been able to modify them in order to produce more seeds for each plant or to change the technology of cultivation or to provide a series of uh, opportunities to make our food more, uh, 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 how can I say, uh, more productive and the city and the society more efficient in general. But what I find interesting is that this revolution was led by uh, this new generation of people that we call the polygraphists. So, the polygraphists are people who have been able to develop a visionary uh, utopia. Of course, when we talk about these kind of people, this is the first guy that comes up to our mind. And uh, uh, it is uh, very relevant for me to notice that also in the literature, especially in neurosciences or in paleoanthropology, uh, this is not naive, to, not so naive as it can be, as it, as it, it could look to think about uh, Leonardo da Vinci as a test to understand what was in his brain, why this was different, why the way he was thinking was so different from uh, uh, other people in the previous generation and why so many people were starting thinking in this way, in this period, uh, while in the previous generation, we had a few people able probably to uh, think in this way. And we, uh, as neurologists and neuroscience has been working a lot, to right, to understand what was the difference in the brain and how the brain could work. Well, in a way that they find out, of course, that uh, uh, besides the definition of genius, there is not, uh, uh, there is nothing different in Leonardo's brain than in our brain. It's only the possibility of activate a specific uh, uh, attribute of this brain that make the difference. And of course, uh, when I mentioned the, uh, the polygraph condition, this polyphonic approach to culture, this is for sure a way to activate these uh, different uh, uh, brain modality. So what I'm saying in simple words is that we know that during crisis, I try to translate in a more simple or more straight way, what, uh, what we learn from Renaissance and from these studies about paleoanthropology uh, we learned that uh, during the crisis, uh, uh, the special attribute of uh, man to be capable to use associative thinking instead of linear thinking uh, is activated and becomes more relevant. And one of the ways to activate this modality is uh, 
the transdisciplinarity in the uh, use of information. What I mean is that uh, these people, and Renaissance, of course, is a, a very easy example to do this. These people stopped thinking that, for example, architecture was something regarding a corporation, um, a specialization uh, within the middle uh, uh, age society, but was a sort of uh, position of synthesis between knowledge coming from, uh, surprisingly enough, in the case of Leonardo da Vinci, anatomy, uh, biology, uh, physics, uh, technology, um, and of course, arts. Uh, it's uh, and therefore it's even more striking that if you this is an article, uh, this is a number uh, special issues by the Scientific American that is uh, about the birth of creativity, where Ether Pringle, one of the most famous uh, important uh, um, uh, paleontologists, has uh, exactly studied this and collected all the literature about this. Uh, we will notice that uh, Renaissance is the easy example, but uh, we know from uh, this paleontological perspective that uh, we have many examples of this. The more critical example is, for, for instance, uh, uh, what are the right circumstances that burst uh, uh, into flame? So we know that the ancestral mind was a virtual tinderbox. So if we know that the brain of the human were already the, the sapiens was already done in a certain way, even 200,000 years ago, what happened 40,000 years ago uh, in this specific period to uh, make this, uh, uh, the form of art proliferating for the first time? So what I'm trying to say in simple words is we know today from neuroscience and paleontropology that uh, art has become, a, uh, let's say creativity, has become a feature of human since 200,000 years ago. But we start producing a lot of, uh, um, uh, a lot of forms of art starting from 40,000 years ago. So the question is, uh, um, what happened 40,000 years ago? And again, also in this case, we know that this was an environmental crisis. The environmental crisis led men to uh, start using uh, this specific uh, attribute of uh, his brain, its brain in different uh, uh, conditions. So basically what we are saying in other, in, other, in other words is that when, for instance, when the man was looking for the fire, sorry, when the man discovered the fire, was for sure not looking for the fire, but he was doing actions and uh, developing thoughts that somehow led him to find the fire, because it would have been impossible to find the fire, uh, trying to logically think that you have to look for this. In, in simple words, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the uh, associative thinking that uh, is driving the, the human brain during crisis is a way of thinking which is a little bit uh, uh, without purpose, without a specific objective, but is uh, a way to digest uh, information coming from different fields, information uh, linking information from one side to the other side of the brain. Uh, Let's say that, uh, uh, in a way, these, uh, these depends by, uh, according to neuroscience, this depends on the configuration of the human brain that uh, start becoming relevant and making a difference between, for example, human brains and other species. Uh, in this case, what make the difference is not anymore the dimension of the brain uh, or the number of neurons, it's more the number of connections. So what, uh, uh, what we discovered is that uh, around 200,000 years ago, uh, the number of connections in the human brain start increasing and start uh, um, enabling the man to transfer information and uh, elaborate information in different ways, not necess necessarily with, with a purpose. Uh, what I find interesting in the, in the discourse made by the Pringle and the neuroscience, neuroscientist is that according to them, in this process, there is no difference between arts, uh, technology and sciences. Differently from what we think today, they are all three products of creativity, or let's say, they are all three um, uh, way of uh, uh, elaborate information which need creativity. 
So linear thinking does not lead necessarily to uh, science or to technology as we thought, as we think, usually think. Without the sparkle of creativity, they don't go anywhere. Well, of course, we can uh, quote many cases like, uh, I don't know, um, um, Einstein watching out of the, the windows during uh, his job uh, as a uh, patent employers in uh, Zurich and thinking about the relativity, restrict relativity theory. This is a classic example that can be done how this could spark. So coming back to the structure that allow us to do this, we should go uh, back in uh, a different uh, stream of science, which is uh, um, genetical engineering or uh, genetical sciences. Uh, the reason is because uh, uh, people like Johan Barney, uh, Birney have been able to uh, sequence the genome on one side and uh, try to understand what where the creativity lays in the biological structures. Um, in this case, uh, what uh, um, Ewan Birney um, likes to highlight is that the genome is a jungle and even more that all creative systems in nature are redundant, full of connection, relationships. They have uh, not many elements, different elements, but they have, uh, uh, these elements are very interconnected to each other. So uh, this is kind of interesting relationship because uh, what uh, Ewan Birney, Birney is el allowing us to understand is that on one side, uh, associative thinking is the product. So this idea of uh, uh, um, information coming from different fields is a product of uh, um, a jungle uh, um, of elements which is uh, the typical structure of the uh, creative uh, structures. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, it produces uh, a jungle of elements, which is the associative thinking. So also in this case, in simple words, what I'm saying is that all creative systems are done in a certain way. So made uh, by jungle of uh, uh, weird, strange creatures, strange elements, as you are being said, and at the same time, they produce similar uh, products. So products that are like this, like a jungle of uh, um, strange uh, creatures. Um, I would like to go even farther that uh, these uh, two conditions, so the fact that all the creative structures are done in that way, interconnected, very rich, redundant, full of shapes, full of elements, and they produce uh, ideas that are done in the same way, interconnected, full of elements, uh, and all of them is uh, and all the, uh, the, the structure and the product is uh, purposeless. At the same time, according to Stephen Gould, um, uh, a biology, uh, a biologist of evolution, these uh, replicate in the perfect way the system that uh, uh, evolutionary patterns uh, uh, uses, uses to uh, determine the evolution of structures. Uh, I will explain this a little bit uh, further. So uh, to start discussing about this, we have to remember about uh, Axley's chessboard. Axley's chessboard, the Thomas Henry Axley's was... Uh, um, mm, Sylvia, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just to be clear if the, the, the voice is clear. Yeah, it is perfect. Okay, thank you. So, um, actually, um, was, uh, interestingly enough, he was a supporter of, uh, uh, of um, uh, Darwin theories. And uh, uh, this was uh, in a period in which it was not easy for uh, Darwin to, to make people uh, be aware of his discoveries. Nevertheless, uh, uh, Darwin never stopped telling, uh, telling in his uh, written that, uh, uh, according to his perspective, uh, Axley didn't get everything about his theory. And still today, uh, the majority of the, there is a conservative part of biologists that still uh, see the word in Axley term. When we talk about the chessboard, for example, uh, Axley, uh, in a way, was seeing the word devolution as a sort of chess play between human and nature. 
so as if the human were in a position, in a privileged position outside the, the, the game, or let's say they are part of the game as well as uh, nature. Uh, Darwin was not think, uh, convinced of this uh, condition. He uh, was more convinced that uh, the human were a sim simply a part of the game and uh, uh, they were not on the other side of the chessboard. And uh, this has a series of implication. Uh, coming to architecture, because I think I'm already bothering you a lot with uh, this part of uh, biology, but I would like to tell you in, uh, in a very quick way what, what it means in terms of planning. And uh, mm, the easiest way for me to try to be more clear in what I want to say is uh, this image. Uh, uh, this image will help me a lot. So here you see how uh, this is the chessboard and this chessboard is exactly Oxley chessboard. So here you see the world as it is organized today. We are thinking that uh, we have nature on one side and the artificial part of uh, the uh, construction, which is done according to our aims to fulfill our needs. Uh, I find a series of contradiction in this, but uh, before finding the contradiction, discussing about the contradiction, I find even more uh, stimulating the fact that uh, uh, this image put uh, in the same uh, um, uh, on the same side of the chessboard, both the people who don't believe that ecology is an issue, but also those who think that ecology is an issue. And usually, and we don't discuss about the first one, but let's discuss about the, the, the second one, the people who believe like me that uh, we need to be uh, more uh, attentive to ecology. Well, the second kind of people who are uh, strongly convinced that uh, what is wrong in this image is that we should have a little bit more of the green and possibly not uh, a very, uh, a very uh, let me say, precise subdivision uh, between the artificial part and the natural part. We need probably more green in the artificial part and so on. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that if I read Stephen Jay Gould, and if I read what Heather Pringle are telling me, uh, even though I perfectly understand and agree with my friend who think that these aspects of the ecology is very important, so how to make nature more embedded in our artificial environment and how we can uh, coexist with them. What I think it's the problem here is the paradigm. What I'm trying to say is that uh, this, what we see here is a paradigm that has no more than 10,000 years. And the paradigm is telling us that what we build is artificial. And what artificial means for us today is that uh, it is not part of an ecologic process. It's not circular. So everything you see on the left, everything you see on the top of image, the buildings, they simply go to waste. They don't have a second life. They don't have a third life. So and, oh, the only ecological thing that we expect from them is to, is to last as much as possible so that the CO2 emission embedded in their structure will be released uh, the latest possible. We are not uh, challenging the fact that uh, it's this concept or that of, of artificiality that is, in my opinion, wrong since the beginning. So I'm wondering why the, uh, and I know that this sounds very radical for some people or impossible for others, why this uh, uh, place that we have uh, on the left cannot be um, part of the ecological continuous. Why we are not able to build buildings that don't go to waste why we are not able to build buildings that follow exactly the same process of ecological system. Why we don't accept that we are part of the ecological system. We are not on the other side of the chess uh, board and we are developing somehow new things that uh, have a different uh, concept. So uh, as you understand, it's in, in no cases I'm trying to say that we have to be more conservative or that we have to build something that looks more ancient or that we have to build something that is less uh, uh, design or uh, um, how can I say extreme or or potent in his image. I'm just saying why its genotype doesn't allow these things 
to be ecological, so to be part of a circle of life rather than to be uh, completely detached, and then we have to think in different terms. Because this, this uh, uh, idea, in my terms, will go beyond simply say we need more green, less green, or we need to attach more green here and there, simply because this will not solve the equation. For the reason I told you before, because it is clear if I watch a city like this and I want to embed more green in the rest of the city, even if I want to do a green facade, there is a, a price to pay. And this price is, is a non-ecological price, it's called waste. So it's also interesting, in my opinion, that we are strongly convinced that we are doing what we are doing in the left because we think that this is uh, giving a positive response to our needs. But I can make hundreds of examples to showing you that we are simply convinced of this because our brain is, how can I say, able to use associative thinking on one side, but on the other side is very inertial. So we are not able to see anymore the dystopic and not fulfilling uh, attributes of this condition in terms of, of uh, uh, responding to our needs. So I would like, so of course, uh, a simple example could be that we know that the people living very close to the Central Park will have 55% less uh, possibility to have uh, uh, mental diseases. Uh, neuro, uh, neuropathologies, 55 percent. And so this doesn't, this means that evidently living in an artificial structure doesn't allow you to be uh, safe uh, from, oh, sorry, safe from uh, this uh, condition. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, from uh, when we're facing the crisis of today, the pandemic, we have to think about uh, of three different conditions as planner that we should uh, take into account. First one, if the architect uh, needs to do the job as uh, in the way it did until today. So it's, uh, let's say, it, it provides services to a market, that, which is the one that we know today. I would say that this is perfectly fine. This is part of our professional uh, um, objectives but it's probably not our aim. This needs linear thinking. So the market is asking for a, a, a certain uh, uh, deliveries, a certain uh, activity, and we are able to offer this. Uh, let's make an example. We are talking about, uh, about uh, the pandemic. We have, uh, we are discussing with Silvia before, we have a, a, a several examples of uh, instant projects. So, we, how we deal with this uh, condition. Of course, we go to the seaside and we will make a, a screen between uh, um, uh, within the seats to avoid uh, the pandemic contact. We are going to do more hospital and we are doing hospital that are more flexible uh, or we are designing thinking, building that are more flexible to allow the possibility to host uh, hospital in case of pandemic. That's perfectly fine, but this is not a game changer. The other aspect is more tactical, is less uh, related to operativity, and it's the possibility to uh, um, link uh, the con current condition, current idea of the city to uh, the consequences of crisis. So in this case, uh, we are talking about, uh, uh, let's say, what we call the uh, sustainable cities. So what can we do? We can integrate the green, the water management uh, and the energy, uh, uh, the energy um, production in the building, which is called the nexus. Uh, and uh, we can think about more compact cities and so on. Uh, this is a very important part of our job and we have to do this. We, have, we even have to challenge the current market to do so. We have to clarify every time to the industry or to the decision makers that the change is more economically advantageous than not changing. Nevertheless, this is not even enough uh, anymore. We need a third level of activity uh, that uh, this is what in these very long premises I was trying to highlight. We have uh, a need of a new generation of architects. This cannot be me. This cannot be the people of my generation. This can be your generation. 
of game changer. This is why I call my generation possibly in the better case, I would like to see myself like this, but probably would be too ambitious, more like uh, um, Andrea del Verrocchio, because I know that it's impossible for me or for the people of my generation to be part of the new generation for a series of reasons. So the best I can do is become a Verrocchio. I can become someone who can help people to activate their associative thinking and their creativity in order to design or to foresee a vision of future cities which are more uh, uh, fit, more uh, able to change our future rather than what I have in my mind. So this is a, a generation of new planners that should be able to uh, deal with the, uh, with the uh, with the condition, sorry, with the condition of uh, uh, current society. So he has to, uh, th there is a new generation of architects that we are expecting uh, that is able to uh, do what isn't expected today, to change the society from its roots, starting from arts, starting from creativity, starting from technology and science. Uh, using transdisciplinary knowledge. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to say is that there is one figure that today is lacking, is missing. And uh, this role can be uh, taken by uh, planners. Uh, the role is the person who is linking the dots of the knowledge that we have to weigh today, is the person who is taking all the knowledge that we have from biology, from uh, sciences, from botanic, from, but is using this knowledge to build uh, different scenarios and potentially a different uh, view of the society. Uh, when I think of this, I'm always thinking of uh, uh, the famous statement by Freud uh, about the four revolutions. Uh, for me, this is um, an interesting statement because even though I don't know how this paradigm will be, uh, I'm, I, I'm sure also in this case that this, will, this new paradigm will have one feature. And the feature is that uh, to do this revolution, uh, our knowledge, our understanding of the environment will lead us to a step down, um, a step back from the idea of privilege that human people have uh, about their role in the world. What I'm trying to say is that uh, Freud, but of course, according to uh, a series of uh, facts, uh, was very clever, uh, intelligently demonstrating that uh, the Copernican revolution was a, Copernic was a revolution of knowledge, but was also a revolution that led human to move from a position of center to a position of uh, uh, collaterality in respect to the, to the universe. Still, when we talk about uh, the evolution of Darwinism, again, it's a pushback from the Olympus, uh, from the top of the Olympus that human put themselves in a different situation. So what I'm trying to say is that I don't know today where we will go, but for sure, we will go in a direction in which we'll, uh, we will understand that uh, our role will be uh, less relevant, but more ecological in a way. And uh, I'm sure that this will lead to a better symbiosis between man and environment. And possibly that the city of the future will not even be city as we think of them today. I don't know why this is blocked, okay. So the question here, when I always talk about this, usually the question from students is, well, this is a little bit uh, um, fascinating from one side, but also, uh, negatively impacting because this means, well, this means that the architects do, don't, will not design, planners will not design cities. Well, this is probably, would be a misunderstanding of what I said because uh, basically what I'm trying to understand, to, to, uh, to tell with the words of Freud is that uh, uh, we have uh, two, um, two conditions. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, something that could emerge as a contradiction in what I've said, but actually, I don't see this as a contradiction. So we have uh, two roles that we have to consider. Until today, we thought that uh, our edipical uh, conditions and our Prometheic condition were overlapping. In other words, that uh, the condition of uh, 
competition with nature uh, in ontological terms uh, uh, was implying that we are able to create. So imitating the nature through uh, creation. Basically, what uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is a different thing, and this, this comes from Stephen Jay Gould. Basically, Stephen Jay Gould is telling us that these, well, Stephen Jay Gould at the Pringle, Yuan Birne is telling a different thing, that creation is part of the ecological process. So we don't have to be worried about the fact that uh, being more, um, getting rid of our need to compete with nature will put ourselves in a condition that we will not plan. We simply have to embrace the fact that planning is uh, as a different uh, uh, perspective. Let's say that uh, in philosophical terms, we have uh, two different, uh, um, two different uh, um, perspective, uh, I could say even more, but uh, if we want to take as an example, uh, very famous uh, uh, text uh, on one side, uh, Farewell to Growth of Serge Latouche and the other side, Dark Ecology by uh, Timothy Morton. Uh, we have an example of uh, two great uh, uh, person who uh, are perfectly aligned with this idea that we need to change the paradigms. But in a way, in different way, they are dealing, in my opinion, with uh, um, uh, not necessarily, or let's say not a game changer in terms of paradigm in the way uh, I'm expecting, personally expecting this. So. Far away to growth is, of course, Sergio Latouche is talking about the possibility to uh, consider that the growth, uh, the reduction of consumes as a way to change the paradigm of uh, conflictuality with the environment. Uh, but, uh, uh, and this is following a, a, a long, long, long uh, series of texts starting from the 19th century. A Malthusian text uh, uh, until the 70s uh, uh, reports by the Club of Rome. On the other hand, uh, um, this is still a, a linear approach to the, to the fact so that we are giving for granted that uh, this is what the planet can do. This is what we can do with design. So we just need to, um, to split the cake in a better way. And uh, uh, somehow I agree with Serge Latouche, but I still think that the cake can be different. Uh, Timothy Morton is trying to highlight some of these aspects from an ontological perspective, uh, but still uh, there is a pessimistic uh, perspective in the way of considering ourselves like the virus of the system rather than uh, uh, the center of the system. Uh, of course, I like the idea that we are the, 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 uh, the bag in the system, but I also think that we are uh, a part, uh, natural part of the system and we can still embrace this possibility. So uh, coming back to the uh, evolution, uh, biology of evolution, when I, meant, when I said that uh, we start thinking using different disciplines to consider not only the 10 year span of uh, evolution uh, of, civ uh, of civilization, but uh, maybe 200 uh, years span and even more about the evolution is because uh, um, what Stephen Jay Gould explained to us in Full House uh, is uh, what the, our misunderstanding of progress uh, as a result of a trend. As I said, uh, Darwin was very critical with Huxley and also uh, Stephen Jay Gould because uh, they, uh, they think that there is a uh, a clear misunderstanding of the meaning of progress of something which is linear, progressing uh, along a specific trend and leading to a result in which usually uh, human have uh, a position of privilege. Uh, according to, to um, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, this can be represented in this, uh, the difference between the approach of Darwin and the approach of, uh, let's say, uh, Oxley can be seen in these two diagrams. On the left, we have the classical diagram by Scott Peck uh, about the evo um, evolution. And on the right, we have the diagram about evolution by Stephen Stanley. On the left, you see um, humanity uh, seen as a sort of center of uh, the evolution, where we see bacteria and the other uh, form of life as, uh, let's say, steps to, towards humanity. 
this happened because you make a flatten, you may, you reduce the time frame and in a more abstract frame because of course this doesn't correspond to reality. And you can see that uh, the men tend to this the apex of the triangle as a force of entropy. Um, uh, and uh, at the end of the the, 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 the story, what you have, uh, you have that the progress tend to the spiritual competence, which is uh, the, the, the uh, how can I say, the apex of the, um, the culmination of the progress. Uh, on the right, you see Stephen Stanley uh, idea of uh, evolution, which is uh, more based on data, more based on, the, uh, let's say, giving the right space to all the information. And we see that the human are simply one of these branches uh, uh, of this uh, structure. And uh, uh, we see that also the evolution is not linear, but is somehow the result uh, of uh, um, of a series of crises. It will proceed as a step, not as a gradient going in one direction. So and every crisis is a game-changing situation, exactly like the one that we are saying. And something happens in this situation, which is uh, uh, something that we would like to understand and embrace. So when I show this uh, diagram to the students, what I'm trying to tell them is that uh, if you watch this, um, and I necessarily have to tell this because we don't have enough time to articulate this, but uh, in simple words, what you see in the left side for me is the city of today. It's the architecture of today. Everything is designed in that way. So it's one, uh, uh, one concept with the clear trend, with uh, an apex going in a clear direction and uh, with a precise scope and a precise intent. On the right, you have uh, something which is built on what is called spandrels. Spandrels is, means redundancy on shape, elements. And every shape is done not necessarily with the scope. Every uh, branch can go to a dead end, but the possibility to proliferate in different branches allow us to be resilient. This is, in my opinion, a diagram that represents the future of the city. It's a city that is programmed not for a news, but for a process. A process able to uh, embrace the possibility that there are mistakes in the system. A process that is uh, uh, so full of uh, spandrels, so full of opportunity, of uh, weird creatures, different, uh, disequal, uh, that uh, they are, uh, these, uh, all these spandrels will be open to possible change that I, I'm not able to think at the moment. So this process uh, as a definition, according to Stephen Jay Gould is called uh, acceptation. Uh, and this is a result of an associative thinking tool. So this is the process by which features acquire function for which they were not originally adopted or select. So the big question uh, I have is if uh, this process is possible to be used in reality. So if we can change literally the way we design from, uh, let's say, uh, a chessboard process into an acceptation process. So when at the beginning I was talking about the difference between the central park and the artificial, what I was trying to say now in simple words is that uh, why we are trying to think to uh, em embrace more green in the artificial part or vice versa, but using the same design process, while in my opinion would be key to define a new kind of uh, workflow design process, concept, understanding of concept that embrace the, for example, in this case, the way that uh, uh, biology of evolution works. So through, for example, in this case, acceptation. So why we cannot embrace that uh, characteristic? Because that characteristic will go beyond the uh, discussion if the objective of what we are doing is to make something which is, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, more ecological or less ecological than what we have today will be something able to self-configure, to change configuration, to adapt to the condition, to embrace the differences and to, to embrace the scenarios. Because now we are not designing anymore for a scenario B from a scenario A. We are designing for a scenario B that can become C, that can become D, that can become anything. 
this is how uh, um, our evolution by, uh, has been working through exaptation. And usually the classical example that can be done for this is the six, the, uh, six uh, finger of the panda. How can a structure survive, a structure that has been designed for uh, digesting meat uh, can be designed and adapted if something happens very extreme and the meat disappear from its place and uh, for example like in the case of panda uh, an animal that was designed for certain things found itself in a uh, in a, a bamboo jungle what what can it do uh, because all the projections were completely wrong of this structure well it was very simple according to stephen jay gould it it, it didn't do anything. It simply had already embedded in his structure so many spandrel to allow his the possibility to use an uh, let's let's say uh, uh, part of a bone of uh, of uh, uh, the articulation of the hand as an opposite uh, thumb, and to use this to uh, manipulate the bamboo and possibly also to um, swallow and digest this. So this is acceptation. So the possibility to create, uh, and this is exactly what you and Birney is telling us about the uh, genome. The genome is done like this. As I said, as I said before, the description was a jungle full of strange creature, creatures. And you and Birney said, we don't even know most of these things, what they are for, if they are useful or not. Possibly not, but they are there. And they are a form of redundancy that allow us to be uh, to use them when needed. So what are the characteristics of this design? According to, uh, you, uh, to Stephen Jay Gould and also Francois Jacob, uh, there is something very similar to this in the uh, architecture of the uh, cathedral. So all these elements, you don't know anymore when, like, this is why they are called spandrel. They, the terms come from the spandrel of the uh, San Marco Church. So interesting that the biologist is using uh, architectural term to define is uh, uh, the the, uh, the relationship with architecture. So basically, um, Stephen Chegul is telling us there are structure here where the let's say the creative part, the piece of art, the structural part, the architectural space are not anymore distinguishable. So basically, you don't know what was born first and what become after uh, used for a certain function. This is exactly how acceptation works. So acceptation works uh, creating a series of opportunities rather than a series of uses. So change the term from uses from the rational understanding of what is a use to uh, try to uh, understand what is an opportunity. Opportunity is a spandrel. And as I said, uh, this can be uh, confronted or let's say reflected in the uh, uh, structure that is probably the best design thing that we have in mind, which is the human brain, uh, which is a structure, the richest structure uh, in terms of spandrel. And this is the reason why it's the place of creativity. It's not by chance. And this is the the, uh, the terms I was telling you before, the genome is a jungle full of strange creatures. So all creative systems in nature are redundant, full of connection, relationship, few elements, but very interwing. So my question is, can we embrace this process in design? And to be even more clear, what is the opposite of this process? This is the opposite of this process, because this is clearly representing everything that uh, Darwin and uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould were considering as a trend, as a wrong trend. So we have taken a span of, uh, I don't know, uh, 50 years, and we thought that uh, uh, the trend representing these 50 years were the possibility, were the instruments to build a scenario. And this was the scenario. So here you clearly see a scenario that is built on the idea that uh, uh, the future is, is designed by the hero heroic face of the car and that uh, the specialization of the city and the uh, uh, rationalization of the apartment will necessarily lead to this. We thought that this was the way and me, like many other people, I was also convinced of this. Now I realize that this was uh, a wrong trend, but the mistake is not 
the wrong trend. And now it's not the time to think about another trend. Now is the time to think how to design without uh, uh, misunderstand the difference between design and trend. These are examples that have been used in different way, or let's say by um, architects that were of course not aware of uh, uh, acceptation, but in a way they embraced form of associative thinking in their design. We see of course from the Baroque architecture, uh, the nerves of uh, uh, middle age architecture till, uh, as you can see on the right, uh, uh, elements of acceptation are really present in the endless house by uh, Frederick Kisler. So again, to emphasize the importance of this, why associative thinking is important today. Uh, what we understood is not that I'm saying that linear thinking is wrong. What I'm trying to say is that according to neuroscience, according to uh, uh, paleontropology, we have a default survival mode, which is the analytic thinking, uh, anal uh, analytic thought. That's perfectly fine. And this is also why the majority of our society, uh, which is inertial, works with this way of thinking. And this is perfectly fine. And this works well uh, for all the period we are in the branch of uh, uh, the Stanley uh, chart. So why we are following that branch? The problem is when we have to cross the branch and follow another line, which is what we call crisis, because the evolution works through crisis. So through crisis are the moment in which uh, this associative thinking is uh, uh, switched on, uh, turned on, and need to be uh, embraced. We have uh, several examples linked, for example, to the crisis of today that led uh, to this situation. So also today, we already know that the majority of the pandemic condition will be the consequences of, uh, uh, of uh, this situation. Another element that for me is very clearly representing the, uh, the crisis, let's say the difference between formality, uh, sorry, between the, um, uh, between the uh, linear thinking and the associative thinking is the different approach between the formal and informal cities. Uh, this is a situation that I always, sorry. Somehow the, I cannot change slides. Okay. Um, somehow, uh, what I was trying to say is that I, I make an example, which is the, what I call the paradox of, paradox of informal and formal cities. So we know that today, as I said before, 60% of the CO2 emission are due to, to the formal city. Um, and we know that according to United Nations, the majority of the uh, negative impact will be uh, will be suffered by the informal settlement, let's say, the, in, the, in the area of the world with less infrastructure. So I'm wondering why we have uh, thousands of pages of literature, especially in the architectural field, not in the other field, interesting enough, uh, saying that the problem is the informal city, while how we can embrace the formal or, let's say, deterministic design for informal cities. Well, I definitely see today that I uh, recognize that is the opposite. I'm wondering how informal cities have been able to develop form of coexisting with nature, of survival, with low impact, with no resources, uh, uh, despite the fact that uh, the pressure uh, generated by the formal city is so high. Uh, using so much resources and creating so much imbalances. So I'm still convinced, and this is part of my most recent publication about informality. Uh, I'm more interested now in trying to go there and see what, not because I'm, uh, I'm saying that the formal city work well. This is very distant from my, uh, my idea. I think that we have to do much better for the people living in this environment. But what I'm saying is that there you can see form of acceptation, which is impressive. And there you can see, because of the lack of uh, infrastructure, because of the lack of possibilities, because of the context, uh, we see form of acceptation that are particularly interesting. Teddy Cruz, for instance, uh, 
or um, urban think tank are working in this direction. So also talking about my architecture, I realized that this was my process during my work. This is a building that I designed 10 years ago. And all the idea of this building was to make a high performance building. This is, uh, this is a university and my, uh, the most possible, providing the most possible flexibility to this uh, project in order to uh, be open to future uses, uh, including hospital, by the way, it is, uh, despite this is a university building, this was designed in this way. And uh, uh, the highest performance in terms of energy consumption and reduction of CO2 emission. I'm very proud for this reason of this building. Nevertheless, I'm uh, and uh, in a way surprised that this is very far to be the, uh, the um, a standard today. Nevertheless, it's very different from what I'm designing today. Uh, like this one. This one is a building designed to create spandrels. And the spandrels are the result of the climatic analysis. Uh, so uh, let's say uh, also I see this uh, change in the process of design myself, and even to arrive uh, to these things, for example, this is an installation uh, done, uh, been awarded in, uh, in uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, it's an installation in which uh, we have really tried to work the maximum potential of uh, associative thinking. And we arrived to design, for example, just to mention one of the, the, the characteristics, the one that we think, or let's say this has been presented in a scientific paper as the first window you see on the left, the first window with the, an organic um, uh, uh, screen, uh, uh, sunscreen uh, uh, system, organic because this is a slime mold. We can control a slime mold with the Arduino and uh, uh, control the temperature, control the color, control the opacity. So we can literally have uh, a window which is uh, uh, reducing or increasing the access to light using uh, uh, a living organism. And we can use all these features also to provide the, uh, nutrient to um, biosphere, which is in front where we have uh, uh, cricket farming. Uh, so let's say we are moving in this direction and uh, this is mostly what I'm doing with my students. Here we see students who are, uh, this is Joy Kwan who is embracing this approach. Uh, this is a, a test project uh, designed on the idea that we can uh, um, design a city um, considering from a scientific purpose perspective the proliferation of biological materials and how to use these in a construction of a real uh, future. These are other examples of uh, um, extreme scenario, um, mostly design, trying to, uh, this is my approach to teaching, trying to encourage students to use their associative thinking. So. Uh, in this case, it means to build a strong knowledge, transdisciplinary knowledge that uh, cross from biology to philosophy and uh, uh, use this knowledge to build scenarios and to build scenarios that can be uh, adaptable to different conditions. Here we have uh, a complete system of construction for the, uh, um, insect farming. So it's an idea of uh, a modular system of housing, which is at the same time a structural and envelope, but also in uh, a, a structure that in between is designed to uh, allow the access to other form of life and possibly also to farm them. Uh, this is of course something that uh, allow me to um, do several studies and uh, to explore more as much as possible the drawing as a um, way to download uh, uh, the uh, capability to activate associative thinking. So according to, according to, uh, sorry, according to, um, I don't know, for example, my uh, dear colleague and friend philosopher, uh, Federico Leoni, um, there is something even more interesting for planners uh, uh, that link them to the associative thinking. And this is the fact that uh, uh, the way associative thinking works, it, it needs a sort of download of information uh, because it's uh, uh, the way we treat this material within our brain is a little bit different than the logical thinking. We need uh, somehow to find a way to um, 
download this data. And uh, uh, this is why art is very relevant, because if you watch uh, the beginning of arts in the uh, 40,000 years ago, you will realize that this starts exactly with the man pushing his hand on a rock and trying to design them, or a man trying to make drawings without any purpose on the, on the rock and uh, uh, trying to download these images. So this is why I would say that uh, uh, there is a further reason to consider uh, planners as a key figure in this moment. And the fact is that they use uh, this instrument, that the moment in which they transfer uh, their subjectivity in the objectivity of the drawing, this is the moment in which uh, the uh, download of associative thinking takes place. And this is a further reason why I would think that uh, we should have uh, as planner um, a better understanding of the possibility of our uh, strategic role in the future uh, design of the city. Uh, thank you very much, Silvia. Can you hear me? Yes, thank, thanks to you, Alessandro. Thanks a lot, really, to, to activate our asso asso associative thinking. <laughs> at the moment and, <laughs> and uh, let's open the the field for the students question um, because i don't know if then later they had to uh, run uh, let's say run to another uh, class so i would love to start with group number 10 um, so guys, if you want, you can turn on your mic and camera and ask your questions. Got that web there? Um, um, yes, yeah, see Bernadette. No, not any longer. <laughs> Turn on your mic, maybe. Uh, yeah, sorry, I had a problem. Okay, so the question is, what do you think are the tools uh, of revolution to make urban environment flexible to continuous climate change due to the rising temperature? Well, uh, yeah, basically this is a continuation of what I was saying. I think that the tools are uh, transdisciplinarity. So, uh, we need to build our knowledge, uh, starting from uh, the knowledge uh, coming from other uh, fields. When I'm talking about transdisciplinary, I'm not, I'm not talking about the classical uh, cross-disciplinarity. So, of course, we expect that an, an architect as a planner design with, uh, uh, with the support of uh, uh, agronomists and geologists. I'm talking about the transdisciplinarity embracing the knowledge coming from the medicine. For example, in this, in this moment, virologists, uh, uh, biologist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is the first uh, first aspect. Second aspect is a little bit more extreme. So what are the if this is intended also in that sense? Uh, what are the tools? Uh, let's say the practical tools. I'm strongly convinced for what I said before that uh, computation is uh, uh, to go in more into the practical field is an impressive good tool because computation more than other tools allow us really to embrace acceptation. So if we really think that acceptation is, uh, uh, is a good way that to, that, uh, to planning that we need to test, to uh, advise future that are more adaptable, more resilient, uh, we need to accept that uh, computation is the perfect way to, uh, in a way to simulate uh, these kind of processes. Uh, if you watch the Stanley chart, uh, there is uh, the way computation works is very similar to that. Um, I don't know, Jen, I'm talking, when I'm talking about computation here, I'm talking about uh, agent-based modeling, for instance, generative design. Uh, so these are uh, very important tools, right? Because they are simulating these processes exactly uh, as uh, uh, we expect. Rising temperature, uh, the reason why computation is important, because now we're talking about rising temperature, but uh, uh, through computation, we can fill the sandbox with the series of information that goes even beyond the rising temperature. So we can use computation to link together uh, 
um, a series of variables that are mostly uncontrollable. I don't know if it's enough. I'm trying to stay short because I have the impression that I took a lot of time with the presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And can can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, thank you, Charlie, about your speech. And I have one question about uh, how buildings will perform in the future and how the buildings can develop and refine climate resilience uh, policies to reduce or uh, mitigate climate risk or vulnerabilities. Um, let's say that uh, um, as I said before, I think we have to face three different uh, uh, three different stages. First stage in, is where when uh, we need to start developing uh, building using the technology and the, the design uh, approach that we know today, let's say for the next year. And we do exactly what uh, it's expected by the 17 goal of uh, the United Nations uh, in general terms. So how to make building, let's say more sustainable, more resilient, so reduce CO2 emissions, uh, uh, have a life cycle assessment uh, for the first time that will be acceptable, so control of the material, um, and be flexible enough uh, for future uses. But this is just the first step. Uh, the second step for me, which is more important, is to cancel uh, the idea of building and start thinking of architecture in a different way. Start thinking architecture as a variation of the continuum uh, of the landscape of the urban uh, design. So what I'm trying to say is that if we want to uh, save our species, we need to start thinking about a single object uh, um, put in a flat uh, uh, canvas. We need to start thinking that uh, every object is part of a system and every time we have to start checking how this injection, how this plugin uh, interfere or is linked to the general system. So we need to think about different uh, scale condition, uh, which means that probably the idea that we have uh, architectural scale, urban planning scale, design, uh, 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 territorial scale will be overcome by an idea of continuity of uh, uh, flow. Third, but not least, uh, the longer term perspective. And it's the idea that probably we need to think about the paradigm of architecture, which are completely different. We need, as I said before, to design architecture beyond the idea of the building and trying to understand how it is possible, for example, to design um, embracing the, uh, uh, by, uh, as I said before, the evolutionary uh, condition uh, of biology. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much. And according to the second part, I have another question related to this one about the yes. scale condition. Uh, what are the main barriers to large scale and the local, net, uh, local uh, climate change adoption? Yeah, well, this is why I'm uh, talking about uh, the problem of different scales. I make I make you an example. Mm, uh, now I'm working a project in, um, a, let's say, a big, um, a big uh, uh, grant in uh, the belt hurricane belt area uh, in Granada and Dominica. So at the moment, uh, the problem that they have is that uh, when design, uh, they design the building, there is no uh, uh, a clear urban planning and they design the high in a very traditional way. So these two characteristics together made this uh, uh, way of living uh, prone to hurricanes, very prone to hurricanes. What we realize by research is that uh, if the urban design, let's say, and the architecture are um, conceived uh, together, we can maximize the potential of the urban design in order to uh, mitigate the effect of uh, a strong wing in the smaller scale. And we can design the smaller scale, the buildings, for example, the way we design the roof, the <clears throat> fluid dynamic of the buildings in order to maximize the potential of the urban planning to be resistant to, to winds, if it makes sense. 
the same study we have done for uh, um, um, heat island effect. So the majority of the problem we have with heat island effect is that uh, the, uh, we have a microclimate uh, inside the house that is uncontrollable and is due mostly because the, what is around the house is designed independently from this house and not considering the uh, reciprocal impact uh, of the two conditions. And of course, as I said before, if nobody is really thinking how to reduce the Italian effect in a global with global strategies, there is no way that we can get rid of the uh, uh, Italian effect in the smaller scale. Does it help? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And we have uh, another question. One of our colleagues uh, write, and if you can read it and answer it. Thank you very much. Yes. I'll do for you. So thank, thank you, Alessandro, that you are speeding up everything. And don't worry for uh, if you went longer for the presentation, it has been just a pleasure. So I go through the question from Arianna Falzone that she's sorry, but she cannot turn on her microphone. So she's asking, uh, since the role of architects is crucial in the context of climate change, especially when the city becomes the leading cause of CO2 emissions, how can we make cities themselves adapt to this climate, of, this climate change? Um. Yeah, I mean, this is the big, the big, big question, actually. <laughs> Um, uh, as I said, uh, I have to answer. The first, uh, as uh, uh, what are some strategies that we, uh, we can adopt? If the question is how the city will look like, how it will be, I like to say that I'm unable to answer because, uh, because of the reason I said before, because if I'm, I'm embracing uh, the idea of acceptation, if uh, uh, I, I knew the answer now, it will be that the answer is wrong to quote uh, Corrado Guzzanti is the same, but actually I truly believe this. So I think that uh, the city must be uh, conceived with these uh, characteristics that we were discussing before. So necessarily they've been radical. Radical means that they don't need to uh, pursue or follow the um, conventional uh, uh, characteristics we've discussed this before. One characteristic is the, exactly what I was telling before. So that uh, uh, the single elements, the architectural elements and the urban design elements should be part of a continuous landscape. This is the only possibility I see to design an uh, urban landscape uh, which is uh, adaptable to different conditions and doesn't create a shortcut between the different scale of uh, operation. Of course, uh, in a simple words, but this is what I'm teaching at the university, so it will be very prosaic. The first thing to do is to design climate sensitive uh, uh, cities. Uh, which, which means that we should always start from the climate analysis. And when we talk about climate analysis now, we are not talking about climate analysis of a certain scenario, but the, the climate analysis of the kind I was telling you before. So a climate analysis which embraces the fact that uh, the climate uh, will have a crisis and will change drastically in, uh, um, in a period of time in which the city will be there. There are maybe the easiest thing is to watch about examples. The examples of cities that for me are showing how a city should be designed is, for example, Shibam in Yemen. It's a, it's a city which is uh, quite extreme. It's in, a desert, it's in the desert. But if you watch the city, you perfectly understand, according to the desertic climate, how, in my point of view, design of uh, urban design, architecture, landscape, and territory are, are uh, merged in one concept in one adaptable concept. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank, thanks to you. And um, we've got another question from uh, Alireza Nuriziazas. I'm sorry, Alireza, for my pronunciation. And I tried to uh, read this question for you. Um, she's asking, how is it possible to, um, no, let's say, as there is this unstoppable growth in face of us, in face of the cities developing, how can, as architect, I guess, or urban planner, to see the possibility to, to adapt the, the project and the future of city 
to, to a sustainability concept. Mm -hmm. Well, now I will contradict myself just for one moment. Um, there is one projection that we should consider. Uh, because again, if, if we believe in transdisciplinary knowledge, we know from demographies that uh, actually the growth of the population will not be infinite. There is a sort of uh, break evil point, uh, and this point is around 10 million, this projection of balance around 10 billion people, uh, according to, these, uh, to the series of information. So in a way, what we need to do is not necessarily to uh, think of any, an infinite situation, but uh, the main question will be now how we can design um, the urban settlement today, probably not even city. We need to always go beyond the, the classical terminology of city, not because I'm one of these guys who think that we need to get rid of the city. I'm thinking that uh, the concept of city will be very different from what from that we have today. But uh, the main question is how we can design a city, uh, a city, well, how we can design a human settlement for 10 billion people in the planet and at the same time uh, uh, be able uh, to feed them uh, with the primary resources and also secondary resources, which means living happily uh, within uh, uh, 30, 40 years. So we have a target. The target is 10, million, 10 billion people. And uh, as I said before, I strong, I'm strongly convinced that this is uh, not an unbearable number, simply because, as I said before, it seems at a certain moment that it was impossible to live uh, in Europe with more than 80, uh, 80 million people. And now we know that this number was absolutely uh, low for what we can do today. So we need, uh, for sure, more creativity now. We need more associative thinking. But uh, yes, this is what I can say. Silvia. Yes. Th thanks, Alessandro. And um, is, is there any other question from, from, from the students? Not just from the two groups? There is a question from YouTube. Okay. Okay, let's go first with the question from Ezra Yaman. Yes, please, if you can turn on your camera and mic. Uh, is my voice clear? Yes. Yes. Um, hello. First of all, thank you for the very interesting lecture. I mean, we don't see these concepts together all the time. So it was really inspiring, let's say. Um, and I wanted to ask you something about some in some other talks that you made uh, before. And you mentioned once this revolutionized city perceptions uh, for climate change resilience, the ones that are done for by your collaborators in Media Hub Research Center, your students. Yes. Uh, that they remind people of dystopic visions that they would never like to live in. And you stated that the idea of people in this case derives from uh, the connection that they make between familiar environment and comfort. Uh, do you believe this perception can be changed or rather can resilient design and planning provide and convince people to a high level of comfort? Well, uh, I, I am optimistic this can change for one simple reason, and this is why I prefer to be in this phase of my career to be an educator rather than a planner, is that I see more and more this capability to see, to have this perception in the students rather than in myself uh, and my colleagues, let's say. I really see myself or ourselves more as a dinosaur. So the reason why I usually show uh, works of the student is because they go far beyond what I, what I can advise. I've shown today just uh, three projects, uh, but these are examples of what I mean. Um, and uh, uh, yes, I, I really think it's possible. And for example, I go to very some banal aspects. Uh, the um, con conception of uh, darkness, of uh, 
obscurity. How do you relate this to, to a dystopic vision change a lot uh, if you are from one or another generation? I always try to mention how Stanley Kubrick in Shining has used the, 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 the horror to show that the white uh, was uh, more, even more horrific than the darkness. But of course, we are aware that uh, the darkness comes from this idea of darkness is something which is uh, embedded in our brain. And we also know why. We know why, because uh, we had to fear the darkness because this is part of our defense system that we have when we, when we were in the tribe. But uh, today, if the, I make a paradox, uh, but I think it gives you the clear understanding of what I mean. Why, it, if, uh, if you watch the city of today and you see, you see the city um, destroyed or killed by a heat island effect, uh, I see the light as one of the killers, for instance, the white light. But uh, it, uh, it, it doesn't, our brain doesn't process this in that way. The darkness is processing that way. So I see uh, somehow, somehow, I think there is an obvious, obvious neurological project. It's easier for a youngster to process this information in a radical way rather than for me. So this is why I'm optimistic, but uh, mostly depends uh, on you guys rather than on me. So I trust in you. It's, we need to see how much you trust in yourself, but uh, definitely I see in you the potential to do this passage in the change of perception of what is the environment. I see. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I have one more question. Um, in, again, in one of your public talks, you made a simile between the Renaissance period our, and our new age of climate change. And you talked about the creative ability. They were. Do you believe the, the creative ability, the um, creativity that leads us to the awaken? And in this sense, do you believe the world of architecture at the moment presents us a statue of David yet? Uh, it, it, the voice went away for a moment, but I think you asked me if the creativity, if I believe the creativity will be the game changer. No, I asked um, because you made this simile between the Renaissance period and our age of climate change. And the simile was about how the creative thinking can um, revoke the ideas and the um, works. And I wanted to ask, like, by again um, playing along with this simile, do you think that? the architecture at the moment presents us a statue of David yet. So do we have a masterpiece of this um, century, let's say? Uh, probably, I don't know. Uh, this is a very, I'm, I'm wondering every day about this. Uh, uh, probably not in the big scale, but uh, I would say that I see spark, sparkle of uh, uh, a new world, uh, uh, new possibilities of uh, 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 interpreted creativity in a different way. So if understood well, if there are yeah. presents, if there are things that we can see today and see, okay, this is what, yeah. uh, because you are talking about, I would, I, maybe I would like to make some examples and maybe you have a look, uh, but always with considering that I might be wrong, that this is not the right example. But uh, if I have to think of example, uh, the th first things that come to my mind are the works, so very small scale works of uh, Francois Roche. Uh, um, uh, it's called uh, Territories. Uh, I don't remember. However, Francois Roche, uh, Territories something is the name of the, the firm. Other architects that work in this direction, in my opinion, are, for example, uh, um, Ecologic Studio from London. They are Italian, by the way. Ecologic Studio. Uh, a third one is Terraform One, uh, Joachim Mitchell. Um, of course, there are other examples of different uh, different level. Uh, if you watch space architecture, you will find a lot of interesting things there, for instance. Uh, or if you study, for example, this is more classical, but if you go and watch uh, what uh, Transolar is doing, I don't know, also in some part of Mazdar city, uh, in a very more, more simple way, you see spark of these things. But uh, probably, yes, I would say Ecologic Studio, uh, Francois uh, Ter uh, Roche, uh, uh, Joachim Mitchell, yes, you will see spark of these things, I would say.
Thank you so much. I really want to check the references. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. Uh, I'm sorry if you feel some strange noise, but there are some work around me. Uh, if they are too annoying, I'll, I'll let some, uh, someone else talk. Well, um, thank you, Alessandro. Uh, thanks, Ezra. And we have just posted uh, a reference for um, like the website New Territories, uh, where you can find some of the of the name that Alessandro mentioned. New territories, yes. And uh, we've got just one last question that comes from YouTube, um, from Fabrizia Mucci. And she's asking, uh, long-term projections of the future seems to ignore the existence of the consolidated city, which either has disappeared completely from future scenarios or is considered as a dead corpse to dispose, going against the present intention of circularity and reuse. What could be a strategy for the medium term development of cities that are currently alive and will continue to be in the close future? Uh, yes, I think it's a very, very good question because I, am, I perceive that sometimes the way I present the thing for the short time, uh, there are aspects that can be misunderstood. Uh, so that when I talk about this extreme scenario, as if uh, this is a scenario completely detached for reality, I'm talking more about the process of design. But I totally agree that we don't have uh, absolutely undermine the existence. This is already embodied energy. Uh, somehow, I can be, be more extreme to, to um, uh, reassure or uh, um, make clear that I understand uh, uh, that I am on the same page with uh, Mucci, Fabrizia Mucci, right? Uh, and this is this, the statement. The statement is that, uh, differently from what I told before about the Renaissance, but this was more a metaphor to express, uh, but I see a lot of... Uh, elements of what I already said in the historic city. I made the example of uh, Shiban before, and I would like to, to say that I strong, I'm strongly convinced that we have similar examples in the middle age Italian cities of already achieved result of this uh, uh, ecological condition. If I think of my city, Pisa, this was designed like this. This was not designed like this. This is the point. The middle age city has a lot of serious, a lot of elements of the exaptation. And also the way in which the green, the orchard were embedded in the city, it's impressively advanced compared to what we are doing today in this idea of uh, specialization. So uh, it's, I'm sorry that I don't have time to show the project of Liam Stambos, which is one of the classical projects of the student that I show, but this is exactly his project. It's showing that uh, if we embrace this, uh, this uh, approach, let's say, talking about the biological evolutionary, what we can do is to take uh, the existing body of the city, the, uh, the part of the city, and use this approach not only to build a new city, but actually to transform in the medium term what we have. This is the pro pro process he has, in, in my opinion, extraordinarily uh, developed by Liam Stambles in, for the city of uh, Auckland showing how we can transform a city which today is a dead body in something which can be uh, more alive and more integrated with this, this ecological uh, uh, discourse. So uh, I, I need also some time, so, but again, it will take a lot of time, but uh, I need, uh, I, um, I thank this question because sometimes in the way I express uh, I have the feeling that could be uh, could give the impression that I'm talking about something that is built uh, without considering what is there. Uh, I'm talking more about using this process also to transform and to use the existing body of the city, especially those who are not designing that way. Uh, I cannot say because it's about the Italian pavilion, but this is a discourse I'm very uh, I care a lot. So if we watch Italy, Italy would be already now able to show how examples of this quality. So if uh, Ezra asked me again, probably I could add these examples. There are examples in the historic cities of Italy where this project have been already done and it's already there. What happened is that we abandoned this process of design in a certain phase. And mostly I'm talking about this, how we build the suburbs, of course, like Jane Jacobs agree with me. <laughs> 
in the Second World War, and we transform this. So I think, uh, just to answer in a simple way, I think that this process can be embraced also to make the part of the dead city today more alive again, and to discover things that we have already done in the, in the past and make them, them still part of our acceptation process of design. Well, th thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Alessandro, for, for, like, for the lecture and for all your answers. And I think uh, there are no longer any questions. And in case, uh, guys, you can write us and we will try to, to give your uh, question to Alessandro. So uh, let's say that uh, we are going to close our lecture. And thank you very much, very, very much, Alessandro Melis, uh, for your presentation. And to, as I was saying, to like, um, to trigger our associative uh, thinking and like many question came out and I think is one of the focus of really of the next uh, Leonardo, as you were mentioning Verrocchio. And I, I really hope that uh, like, as you were saying that we will be able to, to jump into the jungle and to meet this strange creature and to let's learn from, from them, from them all. And, yeah, thank I really much, as, no, thank thank you. Thank you, thank you. Very much. If you if students have questions, just forward them to my email. Thank so, you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks again. Uh, bye bye to everybody, and we will meet tomorrow for our last uh, ACC lecture uh, with the collect collective uh, it is a collect collective etc from Marseille. Thanks again and have a nice day to everybody. Bye.